In the aftermath of World War I, a defeated Germany became the breeding ground for one of history's most sinister turns. The meteoric rise of the Nazis was not merely the result of one man's ambition, but a confluence of economic desperation, political instability, and societal fractures left by the Treaty of Versailles. The Nazis' ascent to power was marked by clever manipulation of public opinion, orchestrated violence, and the exploitation of economic woes. Through a mix of legal means and outright terror, Hitler and his followers dismantled the fragile Weimar Republic, turning a fledgling democracy into a totalitarian regime that would plunge the world into horror. You may wonder, from the beer halls of Munich to the halls of the Reichstag, how did Hitler come to power? The answer is, with surprising ease. The Beginning by 1937, Hitler was firmly in power. One of the keys to his rise to power and his continuing hold on it was the effective use of propaganda. In this painting from that year, Nazi propaganda artist Hermann Otto Heuer depicted Hitler speaking to a handful of rapt listeners in the days before the Nazis became a national movement. The title of the painting, In the Beginning Was the Word, draws parallels to the Gospels and puts Hitler in the position of a prophet spreading the supposed good news to his early followers. By 1937, Hitler was concerned with keeping power, not gaining it. But the painting and its title give us a good idea of how the Nazis used familiar words and powerful imagery to sustain their movement and gain new followers. The links to mysticism and religion displayed in the painting and its title weren't new to the Nazis or to Hitler. According to the future Führer, it was providence. Hitler's favorite word for fate or God that put him in a position to lead Germany to a new golden age. The story goes like this. Hitler, who had dodged the draft in his native Austria to flee to Germany and join the more powerful German army, was one of the many victims of a poison gas attack in the last days of World War I. Blinded as a result, he was lying in a hospital when he suddenly regained his sight and, according to him, had a vision of his destiny. Becoming a politician, and leading Germany out of the despair of its defeat in World War I. Whether or not Hitler had a vision, as he claimed in his book Mein Kampf, historians believe that something did happen to him as he lay in that hospital bed and began to hear news of Germany's surrender. What the future Führer didn't know was how Providence was going to lead him to what he believed would be his glorious future. Army Informant Hitler did not start the Nazi party which is the German phonetic acronym, which comes from the beginning of the party's full name. In German, Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or NSDAP. And what became the NSDAP was initially named the German Workers' Party, Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, or DAP. Hitler didn't start the DAP. It was begun by a small number of ultranationalists who had formed small societies or discussion circles in which the main topics of discussion were how to reclaim German greatness, what they saw as the injustices of the Treaty of Versailles which ended World War I, how to remove allied forces from occupying German territories along the French border, and what they saw as two of the main problems infecting democracy and the influence of the Jews in Germany who only numbered about 700,000 people out of Germany's 60-plus million people when the war ended. The men who are credited with founding what became the Nazi party were Anton Drexler, a locksmith and political activist, and Karl Harrer, a right-wing journalist who moved in the same nationalist circles. In January 1919, Drexler and Harrer established the DAP. With them were a number of others remembered by history, including Gottfried Feder, a civil engineer and amateur economist, and Dietrich Eckhart, a playwright and nationalist poet, who would become perhaps the biggest influence in Adolf Hitler's early political life. Among those who later became famous and influential during the Third Reich, or part of it, was Ernest Röhm, a career military officer and decorated World War I combat veteran, Rudolf Hess, who became Hitler's deputy Führer, until he launched a bizarre scheme by flying solo to England during World War II to promote an unauthorized peace plan and was jailed for life. Hans Frank, who later ruled a large part of Poland, including five of the six extermination camps during World War II, and Alfred Rosenberg, 
who had developed influential ideas that became the foundational philosophies of the Nazi party, including its radical anti-Semitism and the belief in the German Herrenvolk, or master race. The DAP and the number of people drawn to its meetings or speaking events were small when Corporal Adolf Hitler found himself back in the Bavarian capital of Munich, still in the army and recovering from his injuries. There he mainly spent idle days until a right-wing army intelligence officer, Karl Mayer, sent him to a DAP meeting to find out what they were all about. Hitler was not sent to spy on the party. He was sent there by Mayer to discover whether or not the DAP might be an organization that Mayer and right-wing elements in the army could use. Hitler is believed to have attended his first meeting on September 12, 1919, after engaging in political debate with other members. The then-party chairman, Drexler, invited him to join. Hitler had two gifts that stood out. He was a good organizer and soon became a passionately patriotic speaker and one of the, if not the most, effective public speaker in history. When Hitler began attending his first meetings, he knew he had found a home. Though his political ideas were to change and evolve, the philosophical foundation of Nazi party policy, after they came to power, was made in those first few years, the 1920s. In Nazi lore, Hitler became party member number seven, though it's likely he was more like number 55. As they began to attract more members, a person's party number was always above the number 500 in an attempt by the leadership to make the party seem more significant than it was in its first year. It's believed that in his first year with the party, Hitler made over 30 speeches, some over an hour long. Hitler spoke primarily on three subjects, the Treaty of Versailles, the threat of communism, and the Jews. He spoke passionately, angrily, and sometimes conversationally, treating the audience as if they were in his home. He learned what made them tick and what buttons to push to lead them to the same outrage he felt at German post-World War I plight. Membership in the party grew by leaps and bounds. In February 1921, the DAP changed its name and became the NSDAP. Hitler and others felt that the name German Workers' Party sounded too much like a communist name. National Socialism, Hitler and others felt, emphasized the importance they placed on Germany and its community. In some ways, National Socialism resembled communism, with the state at the top of the power pyramid, and the people and industry working for the benefit of the state, and those superior men who could climb to the top of the German economic mountain. In theory, the goal of Soviet communism was to create a classless society in which all people, regardless of race or ethnicity, were equal, at least economically. As you know, or can guess, the Nazi party was radically anti-communist, as were most Germans, especially the wealthy and the military. Still, the Nazis knew that much of their platform would appeal to people who were disenchanted with the internationalism of communism and communism's dominance by the Soviet Union, which most people knew essentially meant Russia and the Russians. The Nazis' home base in Bavaria was known for being one of the most conservative regions of the country. The communists of Bavaria lived mainly in the capital of Munich, and throughout Germany it was in the cities that the communists had most of their supporters. From late 1918 until May the following year, after Germany's defeat in World War I and the anarchy that followed, the Bavarian Communist Party took over the state government and proclaimed the Bavarian Soviet Republic. Throughout its existence, the Bavarian Soviet Republic engaged in a bloody civil war with ultra-right-wing organizations, many of them backed secretly or not so secretly by the relatively weak post-World War I German army. The civil war was marked by extreme violence and what today would be called war crimes, committed mainly by right-wing militias. Some of the leaders of those militias later became members of the Nazi SA and SS, including early party members Ernst Röhm. By the fall of 1921, Hitler and Anton Drexler fought for control of the party. When Hitler finally threatened to resign and form his own party, Drexler and his allies caved, knowing that their party would fall apart without the hundreds of people who came to see every speech Hitler made. By November 1923, the Nazi party numbered somewhere around 20,000 men. And though there were a few hundred female party members, the Nazi party was a man's party. It believed that, for the most part, a German woman's place was in the home, and her career was making and raising children. Hitler's speeches, which were now being printed and carried in Nazi publications like the party's official paper, the radically and disgustingly anti-Semitic Volkische Beobachter, the Volkisch Observer. In ultra-conservative circles before and after World War I, Volkisch 
referred not only to the German people but to traditional German customs and a sense of tribe or community, and was a term used all the time by Hitler and the Nazis. Though by the fall of 1923, the Nazi party was still a relatively small local Bavarian party. People in Germany had begun to hear about it too, on the radio and in magazines and newspapers. After November 9th, 1923, most Germans knew who Hitler and the Nazis were. Beer Hall Putsch The November 9th, 1923 Beer Hall Putsch story is well known. Hitler and the Nazis, with the support of ultra-conservative war hero and general Erich Ludendorff, staged an amateurish attempt to take over the Bavarian government, with the hope of rallying popular support and moving to take control of the country. The English translation of the word putsch is often the word coup, but generally speaking a putsch is regarded as sort of an unorganized version of the word, and that's what it was. In 1922, Hitler and the Nazis saw how Mussolini and the fascist party in Italy had marched on Rome and took power. Still, the circumstances were much different, and the German government and most of the army were not simply going to offer power to Hitler because he demanded it, as had happened in Italy. But, in a gross misjudgment, Hitler believed that people would join him and the Nazis as they marched through the streets of Munich and demanded power. The complicated series of events ended in failure and in the death of a small number of Nazi supporters who became the first martyrs of the Nazi cause when troops opened fire on the front ranks of the march, including Hitler, who emerged unscathed but under arrest. Other Nazis who later became known throughout the world had also joined the party and took part in the putsch. People like the famous World War I hero and flying ace Hermann Goering, Ernst Röhm, Rudolf Hess, and Heinrich Himmler. In and of itself, the Beer Hall Putsch was a small event when political marches and violence were on the rise in Germany. Still, historians remember it for two crucial reasons. First, the failure of the Putsch made Hitler realize that the only way the Nazis were going to come to power was through the democratic election process they despised. Second, during Hitler's trial for treason, conservative-leaning judges allowed Hitler to essentially make speeches from the stand for days on end between late February and the beginning of April 1924. A big mistake. Not only were the Nazis in the papers because they had attempted to seize power, but reporters and spectators in the courtroom expecting a rather dull though possibly bizarre trial found themselves fascinated with Hitler's speeches and the antics of the Nazis in the audience, who constantly heckled the court and cheered when Hitler was giving his testimony, which in reality had become a long speech, publicized not only throughout Germany but in Europe. England, and the United States. Free publicity is the best publicity. Mein Kampf Hitler was sentenced to five years in prison for treason, a light sentence for such a severe crime. Hitler was a decorated combat veteran, and the putsch was clearly an amateurish attempt, which may have influenced the panel of judges who sentenced him. In the end, good behavior, the conservative political climate in Bavaria, and other factors led to the future Führer being released after only nine months. It's also well known that Hitler and those jailed with him received pretty lenient treatment, and among the perks that Hitler enjoyed while in prison was having his personal secretary, chauffeur, and one of the founding members of the dreaded SS, Emil Maurice, who most people don't know, was that Maurice had Jewish ancestry dating from a great-grandfather in the 1800s. Later, after Hitler came to power and Heinrich Himmler had become head of the SS, Maurice was the subject of an investigation spurred on by Himmler, who wanted Maurice out of the organization. Hitler slapped Himmler down, backed his longtime friend and ally, and named Maurice an honorary Aryan, which protected him until the end of World War II. Maurice and Rudolf Hess took down Hitler's story in political and racial thoughts and, when the men were free, compiled them into the now infamous book, Mein Kampf. My Struggle, in English. Mein Kampf is a bizarre book. It's more of a series of somewhat related thoughts organized into paragraphs and chapters. Still, it served its purpose, to bring the Nazis' message to Germany and appeal to conservatives in the country who may not have had exposure to Hitler and his party. Even before landing in prison and writing Mein Kampf, Hitler, seeing the success of Mussolini's propaganda and imagery in Italy, realized that mass communication and showy propaganda including strong images lauding or condemning various subjects, was a way to influence people. 
The 20s were when, along with newspapers and magazines, radio and newsreels were beginning to make themselves felt as a way to spread a message quickly over a large area, with an intense, short message or images. Hitler was not a very learned man, but he had an almost unparalleled instinct for swaying crowds with pictures and words. Of course, Hitler didn't do all of this alone. In the early 1920s, Josef Goebbels, a small, club-footed man who bore a startling resemblance to the famous Jewish novelist from German-speaking Bohemia, Franz Kafka, became involved in Nazi meetings in his home region near Dusseldorf. Goebbels had received his PhD in philology, the study of language in written and oral historical sources, and developed a keen interest in how words could move crowds. By 1924, he had become a member of the party. In 1926, he was made Gauleiter, or regional leader of the Nazi party in Berlin, a city famous for its modern outlook, cosmopolitanism, and the large number of communists in it. Goebbels' success in recruiting members in Berlin and organizing an efficient party organization brought him to Hitler's attention, as did Goebbels' use of propaganda. Whether it was true or false, did spread the Nazi message. In 1929, some three years before the Nazis came to power, Hitler made Goebbels the Nazi Minister of Propaganda. Hitler and Goebbels were to develop the science of propaganda and political messaging into a fine art. It might surprise you, but one of Goebbels' inspirations was the propaganda work of American Howard Creel, who organized publicity for the U.S. effort in World War I. Nazi propaganda had many purposes, including making the Nazis seem to be the only party that could save Germany in worsening times, vilifying Germany's Jews and communists, restoring Germany's past glory by rejecting the Treaty of Versailles, and condemning the November criminals, the Social Democrats, who had signed the treaty and betrayed Germany, and elevating Hitler to the position of Messiah, while at the same time portraying him as a man of the people. The Great Depression One of the main reasons for the rise of Hitler to national power and influence was not a factor of the Nazis' efforts, but the effects of the Great Depression, which began in 1929. Many historians believe that it's possible that without the Depression, Hitler and the Nazis may have just faded away over time. Life wasn't easy for most Germans in the 20s, but as the second part of the decade came around, things had begun to get slightly better for many. The World War I allies, especially Great Britain and the United States, had started to realize that the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, such as the tremendous amount of money Germany was forced to pay in war reparations, actually were unfair and did not help Germany become the stable democracy they'd hoped it would become. While the allies didn't change the terms of the treaty, they did allow Germany to renegotiate some of the terms of the reparation payments and, at times, looked the other way when the German army trained its treaty-restricted forces in other countries to get around the terms of the treaty which had capped the German army at 100,000 men and forbade them an air force. Life was not easy in Germany in the second half of the 20s, but things were slowly getting better. Then, the Depression began. Germany was particularly hard hit. In 1922-23, the German economy experienced an unreal level of inflation that wiped away the life savings of many and caused more Germans to look for radical solutions like communism and Nazism. The memory of that short but intense period came flooding back in the fall of 1929, when it seemed like the German economy and the whole capitalist system worldwide might come crashing down. Simply speaking, many Germans began to turn away from mainstream political parties like the Social Democrats and other establishment parties, and joined the two largest radical parties, the Nazis and the Communists. The Nazis were outnumbered in many German cities by the Communists, but their popularity surged in the conservative countryside. Throughout Germany, street violence between the Nazis and the Communists surged. The desperation of many regular people in Germany drove them into the arms of the Nazis and the Communists. Still, the people who held most of the power behind the scenes were members of the small elite of industrialists and a number of ultra-conservative army officers who, while believing they could influence or even control the Nazis, saw them as a way to destroy the main threat to their power, status, and way of life. The Communists, who had the added burden of being seen accurately, as controlled by Stalin and the Soviet Union. The worse things got for Germany, the better things got for Hitler and the Nazis. Propaganda and Hitler over Germany The time between late 1929 and the last democratic election in pre-Nazi Germany in late 1932 saw Hitler's propaganda machine in full swing. Everywhere you looked in Germany, there were posters, leaflets, meetings and rallies. 
The worse things got economically, the more people joined the Nazi party or at least voted for Nazis in local, regional, and national elections. By late 1932, the organizational power, propaganda, and worsening economic situation had contributed to Nazi party membership growing to nearly one million, with millions more supporters. The other key to Nazi success was, as it had been for over 10 years, were Hitler's speeches, mocking and threatening the liberals, the Jews, and the communists, and condemning the horrible economic straits that Germany found itself in. It's hard to believe now, but young women used to faint and rush to the stage to touch Hitler before he made his speeches. But they didn't know what we know now. Hitler would lead Germany to utter destruction and the death of millions of innocent people. Elections of 1932. Through the last half of the 20s, the Nazis took part in many elections that took place in the towns, regions, and states of Germany. Before the Depression, the results were relatively the same. The Nazis garnered support in small towns and farming regions and, in places, took control of town councils, etc. Still, real success on the national level eluded them, at least at the polls, until the beginning of the Great Depression, which the Nazis blamed on world capitalism, world communism, and, of course, the people they believed were behind these two opposed political theories, the Jews. As things got worse, more and more people looked for someone to blame, and Hitler was more than ready to serve up anyone who would serve his purpose. The Nazis' greatest election success actually came in July 1932, six months before World War I hero and President Paul von Hindenburg named Hitler as Chancellor. But the Nazis had a tremendous organization, were supported by many key industrialists and military officers, and were disruptive in the extreme inside the German parliament or Reichstag. Hindenburg hated Hitler. He looked down on him as the Austrian corporal, his rank in World War I. He disliked the Nazis, but being more worried about the threat of Russian-controlled communism and being influenced by other leading politicians who believed Hitler could be controlled, he named him Chancellor in 1933, despite a November election that saw the Nazis lose support. The Reichstag Fire and the Enabling Act Today we know that the fire that gutted the Reichstag building in Berlin was started by communists, including a simple-minded Dutchman named Marius van der Lubbe, who was captured nearby and made the scapegoat. At the time, many people, both inside and outside Germany, believed that the Nazis likely started the fire as a false flag operation to allow Hitler to ask for emergency powers under the Constitution. Either way, Hitler was ready to take advantage of the situation. Fearing a communist uprising, Parliament passed the Enabling Act, giving Hitler almost total power to handle the situation. Of course, even if you don't know, you can likely guess. Once Hitler had total power, he never let it go. The Night of the Long Knives The communists and other political parties weren't Hitler's only problem after being named chancellor. By the early summer of 1934, the Führer faced challenges within his own movement. This was the Sturmabteilung, the stormtroopers, or as they were popularly known, the SA. The SA was nominally Hitler's to command, but its everyday actions were under the control of his old comrade, Ernst Röhm, a violence-loving former army officer. By June of 1934, the SA, who were used by the Nazis to violently attack political opponents and ordinary Jewish citizens in the streets, had always leaned more towards the socialist aspect of National Socialism and were pushing for a change in economic policy. More importantly, from the standpoint of Hitler, Rome wanted the SA to replace the army as the official military of Germany. And that Hitler could not afford. The army was still the most powerful institution in Germany, despite the restrictions of the Versailles Treaty. Though it numbered only 100,000 men against the SA's 2 million, the vast majority of SA men were thugs without discipline, training, or heavy weapons. What's more, the vast majority of the German people still held the army in the highest esteem. Hitler could not alienate the army and stay in power. Rome's cause was not helped by the relatively open secret that he and much of the SA leadership was homosexual, something which Hitler hated and which most Germans at the time did not accept. So on June 30th, 1934, Hitler moved against the SA and Rome. The men he used to round up, jail, and kill much of the SA leadership, including Rome, were members of the SS, a smaller organization within the SA that looked down on the SA men as undisciplined rabble who had served their purpose and who was now an embarrassment. 
death of Hindenburg. Still, despite his enabling act powers and the execution of the SA leadership, Hitler was not the most powerful man in Germany. That was still Hindenburg, a World War I hero and field marshal who represented the old Germany and stability to many Germans. Had Hindenburg refused to sign off on the Enabling Act or had decided to remove Hitler, it's likely that would have been that. But by 1933, Hindenburg was a senile old man, barely understandable, and only lucid for minutes a day. Still, he was an important symbol, and until he died, Hitler had to be relatively cautious in what he did. When Hindenburg died on August 2, 1934, Hitler moved immediately. He immediately combined the offices of Chancellor and President and declared himself as Führer, leader of the German nation and people. Next, and more importantly, he made every man in the German army take a personal oath of submission and loyalty to him, personally. Today, this is a difficult thing to understand. Still, since the time of the Prussian army, the precursor of the German National Army, a German soldier's and especially an officer's oath was an absolute. Once given, there was no going back. I swear by God this holy oath that I shall render unconditional obedience to the leader of the German Reich and people, Adolf Hitler, supreme commander of the armed forces, and that as a brave soldier, I shall at all times be prepared to give my life for this oath. With these words echoing on army parade grounds all over Germany, Hitler finally had complete power. In our age of black and white thinking, many people dismiss the rise of one of the most evil men in history with a couple of simple phrases. This couldn't happen today. He was a madman, how could anyone follow him? We'd know better. And you know, many people in Germany in the 1920s and the first couple of years in the 1930s repeated some form of the second answer. Sadly, in 2024, 100 years after Hitler served a prison sentence for treason, right-wing parties or factions are rising in power and influence in Europe and the United States. It can happen today. It is happening today. And if we don't understand how the Nazis came to power, we may be doomed to repeat the tragic years of 1933 to 1945. This has been History on Fleek. See you next time.